Welcome to my Theatre with On vlog with your hosts, me, Holly, and Jem. Hello, theatre friends. This is my long overdue theatre a wrap up. I started a theatre a vlog and then I wasn't actually very good at commenting on the books once I'd read them, or the plays. If you don't know what theatre a is, go back to my previous video um, where I talk about what the challenges were and you can also find links to the people who originated this readathon. God, I'm really not on the ball today so my brain is just a bit like, what are words? What are plays? So the first thing I was going to read was Romeo and Juliet. Um, I've been reading that for the last few weeks because I'm in a production um, of it. I'm just off to rehearsals for Romeo and Juliet um, and since I posted my TBR my role has now changed. So I am now Benvolio which is really interesting. Um, haven't had much time to explore it thus far. So I'm just going to do the first rehearsal where me and Kieran, who's playing Romeo, are going to explore the first scene. So, real excited about that. I think we can really do something great with it because me and Kieran are friends already and I'm also good friends with Connor, who's playing Mercutio. So I think we're going to have a pretty iconic trio. Um, so yeah, really excited about that, but I need to do much more exploration of this script to find out who I am. <laughs> Because at the moment I'm at that stage where I'm like, oh, who is Benvolio? Who is my Benvolio? So many questions. Apparently my Benvolio is currently some sort of Virgin Mary-esque deity, um, judging by the halo that I have acquired in this video. So yeah, I'm off to rehearsals to um, explore this. I haven't started reading any of the other plays yet, but I think it's a good start. It's very theatre oriented. And also I love a gender bend and I'm loving exploring what that means for the character and whether we're kind of exploring whether to make Benvolio kind of ambiguous, non-binary, gender fluid. We're keeping it set in the time period so I think it is going to be that um, Benvolio is a woman but doesn't exhibit the normal traits of women in that time period and therefore is slightly outside of society and Romeo and Mercutio are the two of the only people that accept her for who she is and there's like a frisson of um, chemistry and flirtation between Mercutio and Benvolio because Mercutio is also well known for being flamboyant and ostentatious and not fitting to the um, sexual norms of the time and we thought that would be interesting to explore the way that if Benvolio was a woman who maybe didn't want to be treated like um, chattel to be married off by her family that maybe she became a ward of Romeo's parents. As such Mercutio became one of the only people that she would be willing to engage romantically with because she knows that he isn't looking for a wife um, and so that's not a risk to her personal freedom, but she can still have the fun and all the japes and the tomfoolery. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we're exploring at the moment. That may develop. I shall update you. Um, but it's been really interesting and it's funny because when I, um, like, I've obviously read Romeo and Juliet before, I did it in school and then I've seen various film adaptations and I've seen a um, theatre adaptation of it before and um, I always thought Benvolio was a really dull boring character and um, it's only like looking at the text with new light and trying to find um, those moments for it that I've kind of come to the conclusion that it's really Benvolio's tragedy. Um, does that make me self-absorbed? Probably but yeah now that I am Benvolio, the play is all about me. Um, does that surprise you? Um, but yeah, no, I, um, I definitely think that there was something that I wasn't getting because normally Benvolio is always cast as like a younger boy 
and Younger Than Romeo and Younger Than Mercutio and it never really like fitted with me like he seemed boring because what young boy is the sensible responsible um peacekeeping one surely if he looks up to those other two friends he's going to want to act like them and if they are um you know exhibiting these kind of stereotypical like aggressions and and um passions and going you know fadding from this to that why wouldn't he also be doing that it seems strange but like with the dynamic that we've put on it i'm finding it um quite tragic really because Bermuda's only two friends in the world don't really care about him slash her enough to not get into fights and get killed enough to not go um and kill other people and get banished and then when they do get banished they sort of just forget that they exist so um yeah it's it's really kind of sad um as well as the like trauma of having to witness one of your friends die and then one of your friends kill someone else and then never see him again. Um, Romeo exhibits kind of the behaviour that of, of someone who, you know, that um, classic friend that you lose as soon as they get a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Um, so yeah, that's what we're exploring at the moment. I think I want to do a video on this actually. Maybe I'll talk about this in more detail somewhere else because um, I have a lot of thoughts now on um, Romeo, Benvolio, Mercutio relationship and how it pertains to the rest of the story. So there is that. Anyway, so oh, just talked a lot about Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, so that was my play number one. Um, the next play that I read was A Streetcar Named Desire. We are on the train to London and I am planning on getting a head start on all my bit of fun reading. So I have three of the books that I picked with me and um, I'm hoping that this one doesn't talk to me too much otherwise I'll be screwed. Keep the mouth shut. <laughs> directions and descriptions that are more detailed than you'd normally see so he includes things about um, almost a feeling you get off of a person for Blanche's entrance it says she is about five years older than Stella her delicate beauty must avoid a strong light there is something about her uncertain manner as well as her white clothes that suggests a moth I just think that's really beautiful. What I will say is I found it deeply uncomfortable, um, the ingrained racism that's in this. If you read it, you probably know what I mean. But um, I find it quite disturbing to read things that are written a long time ago, which have inbuilt racism, but where racism isn't even the topic that they're dealing with. So like, you've got to kill a mockingbird and stuff like that, but the race is the subject of the story but there's a few descriptors that I did not enjoy and um, a, a, some real racial stereotyping in um, one of the side characters. This is where we get into the discussion of can you separate art from the artist? Give me thoughts on this because I am open to suggestions. I'm also well aware that I am not entitled really to comment on the subject of racial prejudice 
Yeah, I also, um, one of the challenges was um, Pulitzer Prize winning play and I didn't realise whether this is a Pulitzer Prize winning play so I actually ticked off two of the challenges in one because I think I originally wanted to read this because it was going to pass the Bechdel test, which it did. Um, I wouldn't say it's a great feminist like play but at least um, but the women in it do have distinct personalities and it does show how they are a victim of the time that they lived in and the patriarchal society. I got some mixed feelings. Um, the next thing I read is 448 Psychosis by Sarah Kane. So Neve recommended me this to me in the comments of my last video and it's a really short um, stream of consciousness long monologue um, and it was written by Sarah Kane. It was, I think, the last thing she wrote before she committed suicide. It is about depression and suicidal thoughts. Um, I liked it, but I also found some elements of it... I don't want to say unoriginal, but I had some complex thoughts about it. So I was trying to talk to Neve about these the other day. So on the one hand, it felt... A little bit like reading a Tumblr post or um, what am I trying to say? You know when something feels like it's trying really hard to be deep but it's actually quite feels quite surface level that is how I felt about some of it however because obviously then I looked into the fact that like when she wrote it and stuff because I was just reading it as a play I had no idea it um, about who she was or any of that so I then read about that I was like oh now seeing it in this authentic light maybe I like it more and then I was like but does that make it good because you only liked it because of the situation of the artist who wrote it thoughts I mean obviously it's it's an own voice so that's good um I did think some of the dialogue in it's quite witty um there's like dialogue kind of between her and the doctors but it's as if it's like almost playing out in her head or maybe she's reading both parts I'm not sure exactly how it would be performed I did read a review of one performance um which said they had multiple actors playing kind of like the different almost voices in their head which was that sounded interesting um but yeah so that's another another question is if you remove a play from its context does it still have the same like would you feel the same way about it because if I'd have known that before I read it I might have not been as critical of the kind of tumblr-esque um stream of consciousness that it felt like so yeah so it was a kind of play where I could see how performing it it could end up being incredibly seem seeming incredibly bad in a kind of fake woke kind of way like it was trying to be shocking or deep and, and sort of not really saying anything new um but then I could also see how the performance could make that amazing if you had the right performers and the right kind of set and lighting and movement choreography I also I really really love the last line of it the last line of it is please open the curtains um the 448 psychosis is obviously um, what's going through her mind at 4.48 a.m. Please open the curtains is kind of like the dawn, the morning, but it's also obviously in a theatre, it's like you normally have curtain down at the end. It had the impact that it was intended to have, so that was pretty cool. So the next play I actually saw performed was Grief is the Thing with Feathers in London, by um, written by Max Porter. It's absolutely stunning. Killian Murphy's performance blew us both away. Me and Connor were legit sobbing for a large proportion of the play. Um, it all takes place in sort of the flat of the family and you know they kind of make the set so that there's like bunk beds in one corner, a desk in the other and it's about um, a father with two sons who's been recently bereaved and it's just heartbreaking. Killian Murphy who plays the dad also plays Crow, 
which is this creature that kind of represents grief visiting the family. You should just read it because my description will never do it justice. I was trying to like keep my sobs quiet to try and not disturb anyone but it was that good, that moving. Again, I beg everything again. We also got to have a cheeky little lunch in the Swan restaurant which is sort of attached to the Globe Theatre um, because Connor's cousin, who he hasn't seen for eight years, invited us to go for lunch with him when we were in London. One day of theatre is on and we're now going for lunch at the Globe because Connor's cousin invited us to go for lunch at the Globe so look at us Shakespearean. And he actually has performed in the Globe's Nell Gwynn and there's a picture of him next to the toilets. Nowadays I think he's mostly a photographer because being a jabbing actor in London is basically financially impossible if you don't have parents that live in London and can support you in between jobs. And then the last thing that I managed to get to was the Shakespeare prompt which was Othello. Um, I don't think I have anything majorly new to say. I find Iago's long devious monologues quite dry. The scenes between Othello and Desdemona at the beginning are so sweet and beautiful and they remind me of the way me and Connor talk to each other and I was just like I'm so heartbroken about this whole thing because they're like they're kicking ass, taking names, breaking down cultural stereotypes and boundaries and barriers and Yeah. So I'm gonna end that here because my mum has just banged the ceiling or the floor to her to get me to go and make her a cup of tea because she is currently sick and she has a cold. So I'm gonna go and do that. Um, but yeah, Othello broke my heart and it just made me so furious that Othello believed his fellow men instead of Desdemona who was the love of his life and Connor would never do that to me so I just felt like it was unrealistic. Um, because the fellow seems like a stand-up guy. Anyway, it was lovely to see you all. Um, let me know how you did with your challenges. Clearly I didn't do all of mine, but I got through a fair few. And the musical soundtrack that I've been listening to the most recently is Hades Town. Um, because it's just the best. Thank you for um, spending time. Thank you for spending precious minutes of your day watching this video and I will speak to you soon. Bye kids, take care. What's your favourite play, Jim? Is it the curious incident of the dog in the night time? Is it? Apologies for the state of me. I've just been to a dance rehearsal, so we did a lot of hair whipping, hence the ponytail.